Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, the final public talk um, hosted by the Project of Cities program um, as part of our uh, seminar series in term three. And uh, it's a great pleasure to um, to welcome Charlotte Johnson um, to to give us a talk. And um, um, Charlotte, um, as as I got to know her. Um, um, to me, she occupies uh, such a unique role of an anthropologist in an energy institute in a faculty of the built environment. And, um, and her work absolutely exemplify the contemporary ethos of collaboration and participation in many forms at all levels, from the interdisciplinary discourses within the institutions, between specialism, and to build partnerships between private and body body uh, public bodies, between various scientific and social agencies and political interest groups and forming bridges between experts and the general public and create implications that's far beyond the remit, the scientific remit of the project. Charlotte's research focuses on urban infrastructure, energy, financialization and the material culture of the home. She draws on theories from anthropology, economic, geography and SDS to analyze the social relations that are produced through infrastructure. Her particular interest is urban decentralized energy systems like district heating. She has studied that, uh, district heating in Serbia and the UK. And, uh, and, and she will unfold um, some of her current projects uh, that's involving community energy groups. And um, um, yes, welcome Charlotte. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, thank you um, very much for having me. Um, can everyone hear me and see my slides? Is that okay? Yeah. That's great. Okay. okay, great. Yeah, so as um, as Doreen has explained, so I'm a, um, a social researcher at the Bartlett School for um, Environment, Energy and Resources, which puts me in a really uh, lucky position of working in a very multidiscipline, um, multi multidisciplinary school focused on the built environment, um, but able to use my interpretive social scientist lens to, to understand um, some of the social impacts of the way that we design and build our our cities. Um, so the, the Institute carries out a lot of empirical work um, and I work with um, engineers and building physicists um, and architects um, but my background um, as Doreen has explained is um, in anthropology and social geography and um, so my plan for this talk is to give a bit of context about the kind of work I do and some of the theoretical work I draw on um, before discussing in more detail some of the recent projects that I've worked on, which have really um, shaped my thinking around this idea of infrastructural communities. And this is something, this is an idea has, that has come out of the way that um, the drive to sort of respond to adapt and mitigate climate change in our in our urban built environments is bringing infrastructure more and more to the fore. And um, infrastructure materially delineates groups of people it connects people together even though they may not know that they have they share a material connection until perhaps something goes wrong and you realize that um who you may share a sewage link or a secondary substation with when um the lights go out um but what's been interesting for me in the in the projects that i do has been the way that this material connection can actually I think, hold potential for transformative action. And if we're thinking of how we can um, radically rework our built environment in order to cope with, with the climate crisis, then um, I think starting with the way that infrastructure connects us is a good point. Um, so just to start with a bit of context, my long held interest has been in materiality and urban change. Um, and I started when I was doing sort of um, PhD research almost 10 years ago now um, in Belgrade in Serbia, I was really interested in how um, a city that had been in part built under a, a socialist understanding of the social contract could then be changed and transformed into a sort of capitalist um, built environment. And this is a, an issue that other anthropologists have looked at, the um, how the built environment was really fundamental to the making of the of the of socialism really it was, it was a way the way cities were built were ways to demonstrate the sort of the power and success of a socialist political economy but also anthropologists have sort of worked on understanding how built form shapes the way that people understand their themselves and their relationship to their family and to their colleagues and their neighbors and their other citizens in their state it gives a sense of, of who they are and um and their place in the world um 
But when I was in Belgrade researching, you know, the issue there was was around liberalising and privatising and trying to um, get rid of the socialist political economy. Um, and um, you could see that you could see that sort of really profound changes that this was having on people's lives, just as you walked through the city and you could see parts of buildings that were falling apart because there weren't any governance structures or social groups that were able to take responsibility and to um, to care for their building. So, so there were some um, there were some areas uh, that could be that were that were visibly falling apart, you know, and there were some areas that were very visibly doing well, um, which really brought home the connection between sort of social change and material change. Um, but the issue that was really on everyone's lips when I was, was living there and working there was the heating system and the need to liberalise and privatise it. But because it had been built, um, literally had sort of built socialism into the way that the pipes went through homes, it was very hard to to separate out these individual households and spheres of individual consumption, which is what you needed if you wanted to sort of, um, according to some technical perspectives, was you needed these sort of individual households to be separable from the collective whole in order to make them responsible for the the consumption and the economic um, and paying for that. and, and this was an issue that really deeply divided people, whether or not people should be able to be cut off from the infrastructure because the way the pipes were connected meant that households couldn't be cut off if they couldn't pay their bills. And for some people, that was a fundamentally a good thing, that people shouldn't be able to be left to go cold, particularly in an environment where the cold can kill. Um, whereas for other people, it was fundamentally important to be able to get rid of a of a past and be able to start a new um, process of of development and growth. Um, so this really drew my attention to infrastructure, which is a very, um, it's a growing field of interest within anthropology and within science and technology studies. Um, and there have been numerous works that have been coming out in the last 10 years around the way that infrastructure helps us understand the nature of power and politics. It's the way it helps states understand the, um, the territoriality of their power. Um, but it's also very much about social norms and shared standards of living because these infrastructural, these massive technical systems end up in our homes and they are related to the most intimate social practices that we carry out in our homes. The way that we use water and electricity and heat is, is fundamental to the way that we demonstrate care and the way that we care for ourselves and, and understand a sort of healthy um, environment. But they are also, of course, the purveyors of resources. Um, and so infrastructure is fundamentally about also about sustainability and the way that we the way that we, they, they sort of tie the practices and activities that we do in our homes to resource consumption in ways that we can't conceive of because the, the, the extraction and, and production of the resources that end up as the hot water in our showers or as the electricity in our in our phones um, or computers are, are are hard for us perhaps to conceive um, and so then there's a there's a whole body of work just looking at the way that infrastructures can be reworked and so we can continue our our social life and our standards of living but without um, consuming resources with that intensity and perhaps trying to reduce the amount of resources that we consume if we can just somehow tinker with the infrastructure that comes into our homes. Um, and one of the um, big areas of work that I've been working on in my in my department over at the Bartlett has been around retrofit, um, which is particularly a priority for cities in the global north where there are sort of very established, very big infrastructural sy uh, systems and there's high levels of, of connectivity and access. Um, so where other cities are still um, in a process of, of developing infrastructural systems and, and connecting people. In the global north, it's very much about trying to rethink the systems that are embedded in our cities. Um, and this has come, you see in some of the more um, practitioner oriented literature, this idea of the problem with cities and the way that our, these infrastructural, um, these infrastructures are, are very embedded materially 
um, within our cities, but also within the institutions of our cities. They, there are very big vested interests in in the in the way that infrastructure is is run and organised um, and regulated. Um, there's also very complex governance and ownership and you can see that if you sort of cut through the city starting from the substrata the, the different parties that own different parts from the ground into um, the buildings and going up through the, the pipes and the roofs and, and ending on the roof you have different groups that own different parts of the built environment and have different responsibilities to it or abilities to intervene and change it um, and these different groups can have different priorities so um, a local authority might be concerned with with poverty and social inclusion whereas um, a, a building um, a, a landlord might be concerned with um, the maintenance of the building and ensuring that costs are kept down so you have different conflicting priorities but from my perspective cities um, in the UK where I've been working mostly also have a lot of um present a great deal of opportunity and um, because there is political ambition driving change in cities as we've seen by numerous um local authorities and city governments declaring climate emergencies and trying to create targets trying to understand processes of change that they can support and there's also a huge diversity of demand and when you have a diversity of demand then you can explore lots of different ways of delivering that demand and um, there becomes uh, capacity that um, that you can look at exploiting differently um, and there's also local governments lots of um, layers of governance that can help um, mobilize change um, and as Doreen mentioned one of the areas that I work on is, is decentralized infrastructure so this is the idea that um, the the model of resource provision that sort of sites a power plant outside um, some are very remote and then funnels it into where it's being consumed in the city is one of the issues with with, um, with maintaining this high level of resource consumption that perhaps if we brought the production um, and distribution and consumption more closely together then we might reduce how much we're consuming so um, I've put there the photo of from the report from um, the GLA there around their solar action plan for London, which they've put with no coincidence in the background, the um, South Bank power plant producing, um, demonstrating that cities, you know, London did used to produce power right in the middle of the city. And that as these uh, workmen on the front are laying solar panels over think a train station that it is possible once again to reconsider um, how we can bring the production of of energy um, into our cities with the hope that this will enable us to bring new forms of renewable energy um, into our cities but it will also help people connect more um, where their where the resources are coming from and that perhaps we can think more creatively about what resources we have locally and then match our demand to that local supply. And there's also an ambition that, that this um, decentralizing of infrastructure might democratize provision. We might see new forms of enterprises or of community groups coming into the, the utility sphere and into the resource market in order to generate local value, um, value that is for, for the local residents um, rather than more remote groups. Um, but neighbourhood, and this happens not, this isn't just a process of, of energy and of renewable electricity. So, so solar PV is a very clear example of that, but it's also happening in the, in the water sector, which I'll be talking about as well, um, and as well in the heating sector. So thinking differently about um, piping natural gas all over the country, but thinking about perhaps creating local heat networks where the heat can be produced from other sources. But once you start removing, sort of scaling down from national infrastructure systems and relations to a neighbourhood scale, um, there's, there are concerns that are raised. I mean, uh, Stephen Graham, um, Graham and Marvin's book, Splintering Urbanism, demonstrates just how ambivalent the process is and that you can move away from this ideal of universal access. And then you start to generate distributional impacts around who are the groups that are able to mobilise and, and 
start creating cheaper, greener supplies or, or local supplies for themselves and who gets left out. Um, and there's also the uneven spread of risks and re responsibilities that if you're moving away from something that is a sort of national sphere where it's regulated across the country by government and you start creating perhaps unregulated networks of resources, who gets, who has to shoulder the risk and responsibility of that? How do we distribute? How do we make sure that the harms and the benefits are, are proportionally distributed? So that's just a bit of background to locate myself. So where I sit, which is in this sort of area of critical infrastructure studies, but um, also within the field of, of urban sustainability and trying to think about the ways that we we build and live in our cities and also to think about how um, we open up the possibility to for residents and inhabitants to participate in processes of change and I thought I'd just talk through um, four projects that I've been involved in recently that deal with different types of issues and, and help raise to the fore this this concept of infrastructural communities and the way that perhaps our material connections might help us transform the way that we we live and consume in cities. Um, so the first is, is district heating in the UK um, in London and then Energy Wise is a project that looks particularly at electricity um, and then I'm moving into some water projects that I've been working on most recently um, where we've used a co-design process. Um, so the first two projects so the first two sort of discussion lines are a bit more in the critique side of things before moving more into the interventionist side of, of my work. Um, so to start with district heating, I don't know, um, just to give a quick rundown um, of what district heating is. So this is where you have a power source, then you have a network of water pipes going through an area, a neighbourhood that dispenses um, hot water into people's into people's homes. So this would be in the UK, we typically we have natural gas and we have a, a gas boiler in our home that creates hot water for us inside our homes, but a heat network offsites this production of heat and then just sends the thermal, the, the heat into the homes. And you can see here the red line sort of snaking through Pimlico is one of the sort of early experimental networks that the UK, that, that London um, built in the 1940s and 50s at a time when this form of, of heat provision was considered perhaps the future. So this was before um, the UK discovered natural gas supplies and then opted to, to roll out a, a sort of nation, national heat uh, gas network. Um, and so what was really fascinating to me, I did a Foucauldian analysis because this was so unique, this little red um, territory, um, Foucault's concept of a heterotopia um, which a heterotopia is, a, is an alternative type of space in which there are alternative types of social relationships that exist, but they also play a sort of mirror function in that heterotopias are places where society looks at the exception in order to understand the norm that exists outside this sort of spatial territory of otherness. Um, and so this, um, this lens was really helpful for just helping me understand and, and think about what was going on here. So the image is not very clear, but um, to the bottom, the spiky sort of area is a building site, which is actually Battersea Power Station um, and the existence of this power station. So this power station was producing electricity, but it was producing a large amount of waste heat. And there existed a tunnel underneath the river um, where this waste heat could be sent. So this meant that as um, engineers and planners were thinking about constructing um, a large housing project, um, the option was there to try and capture the waste heat from the electricity production process and send it into home. So this was considered as a, as a sort of 1940s tech innovation project because it was about whether we can demonstrate the technology works, but whether we can also demonstrate the finance and the economics or so whether a local authority can, be, uh, can provide heat economically and, and, and buy it off the utility. Um, and this was the layout. So you can see on the left is the power plant, um, Battersea Power Plant, and then the coal is coming in by river, uh, by boat, um, and then it's being turned into heat and sent into. And there's the huge um, thermal store, which is a very beautiful object and still exists. And you can go on tours in it occasionally, which I would highly recommend. Um, and then um, the block of flats. And um, so the system fascinated me, mainly because it still existed. So even though Battersea Power Station closed not long after this whole sort of technical pilot um, innovative use of waste heat was built and being rolled out. So I was amazed that it managed to withstand the sort of profound changes to the way that we 
use energy in the UK and also the way that we develop housing. Um, uh, and some of, so in the archives, you were, there were sort of debates about whether people would move into these houses, given that heat was being provided as part of their rent, which meant their rent would be more. Would they accept that? Would that be manageable for people? And it turned out it seemed to be. But what was interesting was when I was researching, then they were sort of with the new imperatives to produce greener sources of um, of energy, there were questions around, well, there had been sort of new um, types of generators being put in to generate the heat for the still existing network. Um, and it was interesting to me to see way, the way some of the debates had changed and some of them had continued around this need to sort of innovate with technology and with finance and um, and whether it was whether the residents how it could be made manageable to residents or, or appealing to residents um, and so I was sort of saw an advert because by then obviously um, as a drive to social housing is is available to be sold um, and so this was the former housing management body which no longer exists um, so city west homes was selling one of the three bedroom flats in this development and it was sort of pointing out that they did these flats do come warm they come with heating and hot water which they suggest that um landlords might be able to was a was a bonus and a benefit for landlords if they were thinking of renting out to tenants so they're saying that now you know this is an ideal buy to let investment um you can make use of this type of infrastructure and it was it's just um it's a positive thing. But what was also interesting at the time was the Battersea power station was being uh, redeveloped. Um, so there's a whole sort of regeneration area, opportunity development area around Battersea, Vauxhall, Mine Homes, that um, a massive amount of redevelopment where they were putting in a heat network into the whole power station for the flats. Um, and this idea of connecting back across the river to perhaps use the thermal store, perhaps, as they say, um, Perhaps they could use spare boiler capacity and the Pimlico site to heat the houses in Battersea. Um, or perhaps they could be selling the energy back from the Battersea, um, the new Battersea heat network back across the river to the Pimlico network. And this, so the leaseholders that I, one of the leaseholders that I spoke to in the Pimlico heating network was explaining that they see in their service charge the need to, that the cost for paying for this new generator and boiler system going into their Pimlico site and then they're concerned that are they being charged for bigger capacity are they creating a system that's bigger than their estate needs in order to start selling energy across the river and if so are they going are they going to see profit from that you know there's a very unclear relationship um as it turns out, I, it didn't. I don't think that tunnel has been reopened, and I don't think they are. There is any connection between the two systems, but nonetheless, that's something that um, has come forward very much with other new heat network developments. I've been working with an organisation called Fuel Poverty Action around concerns that people have um, when people buy houses in estates that have this new forms of heat networks and they're unclear they seem it feels that they're using their personal mortgages to make an investment in sort of london's low carbon transition without that being very clear they're very uncertain about why they're taking on private debt in order to fan, to to finance what is a, a more sort of national or, or or local transition so the points that I wanted to take forward out of this example was the way that housing development is really linked to technical and financial innovation in infrastructure design and delivery, but also the different ways that residents participate and, and contribute to innovation, and that might be active or passive. So and that stems from providing experiential knowledge about the system. So residents say, you know, they have to call up, they say this part of the system isn't working, you need to connect it here, there's a problem here, there's something going right here. Um, or, respond, or um, adapting the way that they live. For instance, in Pimlico, the heat network doesn't come on very early in the morning and someone was explaining to me how they just put on an extra jumper in the mornings because they know they're going to be cold for, a, for an hour until the heating comes on. To also the new sort of drive around um, residents being credit lines, being able to take out personal mortgage loans in order, that can then be funneled into, in part, paying for some of this infrastructure. 
And the second project I want to talk about is um, an electricity project. So this is a very different materiality because electricity wires are much more, uh, a much less sort of, uh, they're just a very different material from a big fat water pipe sort of snaking through streets. And this project was um, a, a very large sort of four year project funded as part of the smart meter rollout. So it's through um, sort of regulated by government to understand how fuel poor and low income homes might benefit or not from smart meters. And the idea that we were trying in this particular project was the need to shift your electricity consumption in time. And so the, where this um, relates to the concept of infrastructural communities is the point that people who are connected to the same secondary substation of their electricity network, um, that substation you can't, um, if uh, so the has to be sized to the peak. Um, sorry, this is a too technical explanation, but but um, so the idea is that if you can limit the peaks in electricity demand, um, you might be able to either bring more sources of renewable energy on stream. You might be able to avoid using bigger, remote, uh, less, uh, more more carbon intense sort of power plants. Um, and so this project was particularly looking at can we incentivize people living um, in a certain part of London to shift their, their electricity consumption away from the peak time that we all consume electricity which is a sort of early evening weekday when we all when everyone back in the days when we used to go out to work would come home and turn on the kettle and uh, watch television and, and cook their dinner um, so it was around um, trying to see whether people in their homes could flex their demand and whether that would have an impact at the secondary substation level. But the thing I wanted to focus on really was um, was the way people that re responded to what we were asking them to do. So they had a smart meter and then we asked them to sign up if they had a prepayment meter, if they had to load money onto their meter before they got their electricity. Um, we were asking them to avoid using electricity during certain week time days we'd send them a text message saying tomorrow night could you reduce the amount of electricity you use um, and if they're on a credit meter we were saying um, could you we'll give you free electricity at the weekend on, on either Saturday or Sunday if you could try and reduce the amount of electricity you're using during the weekday um, evenings um, but what was really interesting to me so these types of energy flexibility trials have happened before but they tend to be um, perhaps more um, you get more male um, household signing up, male consentees. But uh, because we were working in social housing, we had a lot of women signing up to our electricity flexing trial. Um, and it was really interesting to me when we ran some qualitative, qualitative research, the strategies that people used in order to sort of manage their own chore doing um, to generate these system level benefits. Um, so we had some people saying, um, where I'm working, I can't, you know, if I'm out at work, I can't run the washing machine on. I can't put the washing machine on, but my sister, I'll just text my sister and ask her to do it. So we get the washing done essentially before the evening peak comes. And then we had people talking about the praise that they got from their families when they received a very small reward. In this case, it was £13 someone had for, for a few months of trying to shift the household's electricity consumption. And then other people talking about the way that managing their electricity consumption really resonated with the kind of the ethics of avoiding wastefulness and um, and being disciplined. So um, that they were trying to instill through their sort of their own house um, household economics and, and economizing. Um, so one person said more homework and less TV. Um, but there were people who didn't shift, which were also, was also very interesting. So for instance, we had cases where um, the man of the household would say yes to the energy shifting trial, but they wouldn't communicate. They wouldn't say to the person who was actually responsible for doing all the laundry and the housework that generated most of the electricity demand hadn't explained that that was happening. So um, that household then wouldn't shift, as, as one of the gentlemen says. We just plod on as we normally do. She cooks her meals, and if it goes into bonus time, which was the time we were trying to avoid using electricity, we're not going to turn off our electric cooker to save, we're just going to carry on. Um, from other people who didn't sign up because, as they say, I don't think it's worth it. Why, why should it be the responsibility of the chore doer to try and generate system level sort of benefits in terms of renewable electricity when they're actually just trying to keep the house going? Um, 
And so again, this this um, this sort of brings to the fore the differences that people experience when electricity, when infrastructure in their home starts to change. And, and, you know, specifically, there can be an impact, a gender impact, particularly around electricity and women being responsible for most of the chore doing in the homes. But the things that I really wanted to take forward was the way that people were actually, what I found interesting was the way that people were using their appliances to experiment with energy system transition. So they were thinking of ways that they could actually participate in trying to reduce peak demand so something they weren't individually responsible for but were contributing through to through being part of a collective and the way people were actually trying to experiment and try and participate um, as well as the way that they were seeing that as a um, in terms of producing value in terms of getting applause from their family for having managed it and that was something that I felt um, really important to think about in the context of questions, bigger questions around who gets to benefit from infrastructural transition. Um, and then to move on to some projects that actually start working with um, groups of people um, specifically to try and intervene in infrastructure. Um, so the first project that I wanted to talk about is engineering comes home and this was something that um, was funded by the um, engineering physical sciences research council and professor sarah bell at um at ucl in my department so she um led it it was part of her idea around this concept that that um, people can be involved in technical decision making in designing infrastructure systems, particularly if we're trying to rescale infrastructure to local to neighbourhoods. Um, and I was brought onto the project as the social researcher. Um, and the idea was um, was to pilot this process. So this wasn't a group of people who wanted to see change in their neighbourhood. Um, we were trying to, dis to discover how can we engage community groups in this idea of of intervening in the infrastructural provision in their in their local areas? Can we do it? Can we create toolkits? Can we create processes that that are able to support groups um, in intervening in infrastructure? So the area um, that we were looking at was really the nexus between water, energy and food consumption, um, with the idea being that when you start looking at the way people act in their homes, what they, they're actually very aware of the connections between water and energy and food consumption, particularly if they're trying to manage their bills um, and feed their household, then um, what we were thinking was that they may be able to suggest um, changes that could be made to the way that they're the resources were coming into their neighbourhood that might um, reduce how much um, uh, was being consumed, or else find alternative sources. So find, you know, locally grown vegetables, perhaps, or locally produced electricity. Um, so that's what the idea was. Um, but what was fascinating for me was to sort of understand the reality. Um, so this is a, an estate that was built in the 1930s and then renovated in the 1970s with a um, heat network. And then it was sort of in the process of having a, an estate wide in, upgrade and sort of maintenance um, work was ongoing, which is why the management body had thought that this um, estate, that people in this estate might have some opinions and some experiences around what could be how they could be involved and what could be improved. Um, but just to talk about some of the complexity, if you look at this picture of their courtyard here, you can see um, when we're talking about thinking of how people can intervene, um, you have different groups of so the little, the sort of hexagon, the, the different um, wooden planters are owned and run by the tenants and residents organization, but the garden that they're sitting on is sort of managed by the management body's gardeners. And the water is the, domain so the downpipes that are coming down the outside of the, the um, building that are taking rainwater away from the gardens and into the drains are managed by the by a different body the maintenance body not the gardening body um, and then you have the split as well between um, leaseholders who have to pay for certain charges and tenants who don't have to pay so that was um, 
helping me to understand that people were sort of caught up in lots of different social relationships through their built environment and they had different um oops uh different um they could make different interventions according to their tenure so i mean that that sort of happened inside the homes as well so if you were a, a social tenant you get your bathroom is sort of uh, maintained by the management body but your kitchen you have to fit out yourself with all your appliances whereas though if you're a private tenant you probably come into a kitchen that's fully equipped but you're you're um you're responsible for for anything that breaks down in the bathroom or anything like that so and there are a range of subjectivities that people could call on to create change or to intervene um so that comes from sort of choosing which electricity supplier they wanted to be with to lobbying their local council to make sure that waste deliveries were continuing to run. Um, so the co-design process that we used, we started with some qualitative research um, that I was wanting to understand precisely these kind of this context and the material and social possibilities for intervention and then moving through a co-design process where um, to try and sort of pilot our own um, processes and, and bits of kit that we were making. Um, and so from the qualitative research, which was really interesting for me, was the way that when people discussed how they cooked and cleaned and, and um, recycled, um, there was very evident a sort of resource managing self. So there were people they were explaining, you know, when I cook, I measure, I don't waste things. Um, and waste was a really big source of concern. People were very keen not to be a waster um, and so as someone else said so although they weren't they didn't have their own boiler they would turn the, each individual radiator off in their house before they left it because they didn't like the idea of the radiators being on and heat being wasted when they were going out to the shops or something so they had an ethics of consumption that they were acting on but that actually this remote resource managing self was constrained um, so and that was constrained sort of by the material configuration of their flat for example I don't have space for a shower I can't put a, a tumble dryer in people would talk about but it's also constrained by the um the relationships they're in so for example one tenant was describing how the shower drips all the time but the landlord won't change it so that was just an ongoing source of of, of um unnecessary sort of waste of water that, that the tenant wasn't able to resolve but that was also the case with other people sort of in the home so one um, mother was describing how her daughter would throw food away because it was past its sell-by date whereas though that was an anathema to her that she didn't where she came from she explained we eat till we feel the food is spoiled we don't throw something out because it's ex because there's a date printed on the package that says it's expired um and then your sort of the ability to manage resources is also constrained by other people so someone talked about how they had put their recycling um in um in the communal recycling bin but then they see other people put black waste in there or, or non-recyclable rubbish and she thinks well does that mean my recycling is not going to be recycled then what I'm doing I can't I'm not able to recycle because the way that other people use our communal systems um, so it's interesting to bring these dynamics of the, of the different perspectives and the different understandings of constraints and how people understood you know where they had agency to act and how their agency was limited by these different relationships that they were in through their through their housing um, and so we talked people through a situation um uh so we were working with an organization called ii lab who ran a um and with a an academic called um rob coma from he was at newcastle at the time um and we ran a co-design process where people would sort of reimagine situations on their estate and then we discussed um and then we kind of came together and discussed the different ideas from sort of uh renewable electricity production to food growing to um creating a system for sharing um, unused stuff that you would have in your home um, and then people had to come together and come up with what the core areas they wanted to explore more for their estate were and they came up with five ideas from waste compaction to wormeries to rainwater harvesting and food sharing um, and then in the second uh, workshop we sort of had a an app that people could look um, to, to explore what these different types of ideas, design ideas, might mean for their estate. So they could sort of see, um, okay, well, each flat produces roughly this much food waste. And if we could convert it into um, compost, we would end up with, with this much sort of uh, fertile gardening space. And, and what was really interesting for me was the way people use their understanding of the estate um, 
because each of these parameters could be changed. So they would think, well, I know that around here we probably get about half the people would would be interested in bringing their food waste to a food bin. Um, but they also use their sort of understanding of the layout and of the aesthetics of the state to think, well, if we put a worm away, we would want it we wouldn't want it near these doors or we wouldn't want it to get in the way of people's access. So they had a very detailed understanding of the social and material context that they would then try and fit these different design ideas into. Um, and then we worked through, so people voted on which idea they wanted to explore in more detail and they opted for rainwater harvesting. And so in the final workshop, we went out on what we called, what Sarah called an infrastructural safari, really to understand, okay, where are the downpipes? Which ones are being contaminated with um bathroom waste and which ones would just have rainwater that we could perhaps divert and put into the garden um, and um, and so that um, so really helped us get a sense of the processes that we were using um, and and how it was possible to take this kind of detailed qualitative insight of the way that the social and material relationships constrain and enable different forms of agency um, and how we might be able to use that in in an interventionist kind of study where we're trying to do something differently we're actually trying to put in a bit of kit um, and that is um, yeah so just to sort of summarize the points in that project it was for me what was really interesting was the way that um, agency was distributed um, and the way and people's own understanding of that and their their um, their ability to, to deploy different subjectivities to achieve change so they would go and lobby a governance body say you know I'm a social tenant you have you have a responsibility to fix this thing Um, and I was also really interested in the way that people tinkered. So people would make where they had sort of shoddy systems that weren't working, the kind of strategies they would use to to actually mitigate sort of technical failure and and, and not be um, be brought into it. So that was things like um, if the outside lighting was too strong, they wouldn't use lights in their own flat because they just didn't want that. You know, it was a concern that, that too much electricity was being used. Um, so, but what was also clear through the co-design process that although people had this, this sort of ethical self that they were trying to um, uh, enable through their material and social relationships, they could also fail to recognise that others, the, the sort of the ethical consumption of others. Um, and so that was definitely that sort of split between um, what we saw splits between life stage. So people felt that, you know, if they were retired, they had more, they were able to act in a way, they had more time um, to be able to act in a way that perhaps people with younger children weren't able to, to manage um, resources as conservatively. Um, also split between leaseholders and tenants. So there was a sense that if, from the leaseholder side, that if leaseholders were paying something, they were more likely to conserve stuff than, than a tenant who wasn't seeing a sort of additional financial uh, impact. Um, so those were some of the things that I took forward and I found that um, uh, Nortia Marius's idea of, of material participation really helpful for understanding this idea that participation in change is actually something that we do with the things with our built environment um, and that's sort of underpinning the idea of, of infrastructural communities that, that infrastructure is used by people in their construction of an ethical self um, and that when we start to change the infrastructure, and particularly when we start to decentralise infrastructure, these material connections become more evident and visible and, and more amenable to producing local value. And whether that's local to the household in the terms of demonstrating perhaps the ability to manage chores um, and domestic labour to produce systemic value, um, or whether that's um, uh, sort of visible in in a neighborhood sense in that you could put pv perhaps on the roof of your of your housing estate um but that um the connections they don't align so within within this kind of work around community energy there's a kind of community of place versus community of interest type um uh forms of uh, units of analysis. So are we dealing with a community of place or are we de dealing with a community of interest? But, but what was interesting to me was the way that infrastructural communities, the infrastructure actually splits both. So 
communities of place are split because people aren't connected, even though they're on the same street, they may not be connected to the same, for example, electricity substation. They may be on a different network. Um, but they can also split communities of interest, as we saw, um, you know, and that people think that although they're all living together in the same state, people with different lifestyles or with different um, incomes or, or um, different forms of tenure from a private renter with a landlord to a social renter to a to an owner occupier, they, these communities of interest get split as well by the infrastructure. And yet, nonetheless, what was interesting was the way that they can still provoke opportunities for action. And this um, is something that when I'm now taking forward into a project that I'm working on as a social researcher, again with um, uh, Professor Sarah Bell, who is at UCL, but this project is a water project that's being led by Professor Adrian Butler at Imperial College London, um, where the um, the big objective is to understand the way that um, water systems, the way that communities can be brought into the management of water in London. Um, and this uh, is really responding to the fact that London is stressed in terms of the availability of drinking water um, and that the growing population has, but it's also um, uh, stressed in the fact that um, with more extreme weather events, we see more sort of flooding and downpours and the city struggles to cope. You get environmental damage as, as the sewers get overwhelmed. Um, so again, there's this sense that perhaps we can decentralise, perhaps if we can find space in our cities, in our states for green infrastructure, for greening things, we can reduce some of the impacts of, of climate change. Um, and and um, so this is a project that's actually ongoing and I only had a few sort of um, comments. We've run a similar process, a co-design process, so this um, with a, an estate run by the same management body, that's the Leather, Man the leather Market um, Joint Management Board that runs some of Southwark's housing. Um, and this estate has a very large concrete playground above a car park that hasn't been used for at least 30 years so it was designed in the 60s and the idea was that each of the tower blocks you can just see one corner of one in that picture there we had a homework room and then um that the people you know the households in that tower block could use and then they could, the kids could go out and play in that big space on the top of the car parks but it hasn't been it's been closed for security concerns for a long time um but some people have wanted to turn that into a green space and it's it's a very large space so it, there is possibility that if it was green, it might actually have a material effect on the water system in terms of delaying the amount of water that goes in a storm event that goes into the sewers. Um, and so we adjusted our processes slightly to try and um, build what we're calling infrastructural literacy because, um, you know, trying to support residents in engaging with the technical and expertise being that gets produced about sites and, and being a, um, supporting groups to be able to understand and act and on that um, with that expertise to be able to use it productively um, and so we ran a similar process of doing some contextual research and then we discussed our values but, but it was slightly more less sort of open and experimental because the idea had been set already by the residents group that they wanted a green space there um, and so then it was much more about developing systems and toolkits that could help people assess um, how much water would be needed to water a garden, but also what, whether there would be any impacts of turning this from, from a concrete space into a green space on the local water system. Um, I'm just a bit aware of the time, so um, do please ask me any questions about this, but this is a, an ongoing process. So we've got to the stage where the residents designed a garden and then submitted some funding bids and received um, some money from the the GLA, so the, GLA, the Greater London Authority have a Greener City Fund, which um, awarded almost £20,000 to the gardeners group to start to start the greening process. But then now in the implementation phase, there are still further problems in terms of trying to buy um, a structural survey and understand what's possible, as well as ongoing concerns over other residents around the sort of safety and security of the roof. Um, but what has been interesting about this process was um, understanding a bit the, the issues mobilising action because we were now working with a group of people who wanted to see change rather than who had agreed just to participate in our pilot process. Um, is that you had people who were driven by environmentalism, but there were also people who were 
driven by this fear of, of um, the term regen eviction, where, you know, estates are kind of, they wanted to demonstrate the care and their, their willingness to act for their, um, for their estate and, and build community. Um, so and it, uh, that form of, of environmentalism in terms of local care for their, for their area. Um, and so the points that I just wanted to end on really was, was to think through the role for, as I see it, for infrastructural communities, so that it is possible to do urbanism through infrastructure to sort of think about the way that we can change and manipulate our built environments um, to create bespoke and context sensitive technologies and perhaps to um, engage and ideally empower residents. Um, and I think it just highlights this ability for residents to be involved in the technical work of creating a more sustainable and livable city. Um, and I just wanted to briefly recap some of the projects and then I'd be really um, happy to take questions on any of uh, these ideas or, or projects discussed. So from the district heating example, it was really the question of how is housing development linked to technical and financial innovation and infrastructure provision? And how does this shape the ability for residents to get involved in change? Um, from energy wise, it's really that as we start to create new, new resource markets around sort of being flexible in your consumption, who gets to participate um, under what conditions? It's, it's not often it's not often the kind of the chore doing that is imagined when we imagine the smart future of energy. It's more the kind of um, big lows that the electric vehicles um, and transforming the, the, you know, the smart home with all the bits of kit. But in fact, if your only bit of kit to participate is a smart meter and your washing machine, um, that still counts as a form of participation. And perhaps we need to understand and design for um, that, that form of participation as well. Um, and then to the co-design um, pilots that we've been running with the Engineering Comes Home project and Camellia is, um, is the way that material connections provide opportunities to act on the resource intensity of urban life. And that this is an ongoing research project, so it's an open question and continues to be whether it's whether we'll be able to achieve it in these projects, but I believe that it will be possible. Um, and so I, just to conclude, I just wanted to end with that, that when you know our homes and our appliances get drawn into urban infrastructural networks, they're the material we use to experiment with and participate in urban sustainability and, and transform our cities. Um, and to end with a quote again from Marius with those on, and Tironi, that the experiment is a way of shifting the initiative of demonstrating that people possess greater capacities to transform the conditions of their everyday life than they had previously thought. So that's the end um, of my lecture. I realise I'm not quite sure what to do, how to come back to the teams. Um, hello. Hi, do I, am I still sharing my screen? I'm not sure. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, you can you can um, use maybe the final diagram or something. Um, but uh, we're also we can uh, switch back into uh, um, people mode <laughs> but, uh, as you wish. Don't worry. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Charlotte. Um, that that's a um, um, really enticing um, combination of uh, highly scientific and effective um, um, in a way design experiments. Uh, with multiple uh, agencies and then also uh, the series that you've drawn. I think um, it's it's going to be very, very useful for us um, uh, in terms of research and some of the design proposition that's going to emerge. Um, I'd like to open with a question and then like to also ask the audience uh, to follow uh, with their questions. Um, and um, I'm just really struck by this idea, uh, perhaps you know the anthropological um, precedent like the notion of the savage mind, um, Levi Strauss's, and you know the, the the let's say the capacity of bricolier, uh, kind of meets the infrastructural safari uh, of inner London estates, um, and uh, and this kind of did I find your processes basically is it's a matter of both untaming the mind, you know, it's kind of releasing it from certain givens, um, and then. Um, um, yeah, I think let's let's just uh, have the faces. I think that's that's quite straightforward. Um, and um, and and then also and then 
how to how to do that in a way so there's not only about let's say conceptually uh, to be able to develop a different um, accessibility into something which is so invisible in some ways and then to bring it into visibility so therefore you can become the bricolaire and then start rearranging reassembling and 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 putting the participatory mode uh, back into your own environment um, can you share with us a little bit more about this kind of toolkits how do you go about to um, do you do you find yourself drawing diagrams? Do you find yourself presenting them with photographs? And I, you know, this kind of really playful thing about the uh, the infrastructure safari. You know, you basically take them for a walk to these spaces. They probably pass by every day and not notice anything, and basically talk it through. And and to kind of give all those who had a chance to participate a new image of their own home. And just yeah, just kind of the design of the two kids. Do you work with others um, to to kind of formulate? Um, and also kind of the image that you, you presented as the process. Um. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Yes, yeah, so the toolkits, yes, they are. And they're all um, being, they, they're all sort of open access and available. So the idea is that we're sort of piloting processes and tools that then other people should be able to iterate and use and, and apply. Um, and they should. So um, Sarah Bell is sort of in the process of building a website. So I will make that available. Um, around this concept of bottom-up infrastructure um, and then also the Camellia project, the water project, where there will also be a sort of community portal of all the tools that we're developing. Yeah. But yeah, so just um, how it sort of works. So I come into the project with my sort of qualitative research toolkit. So that involves going in and talking to people and then with the Engineering Comes Home project, it was using resource use diaries and asking people to mark down and, and giving them a plan of their home and saying, OK, where do you spend most of your time? What do you do? Who's in the room at different times? You know, and how are things getting done essentially in your home? Um, and um, and then that so that then helps me sort of gauge a bit about um, their so the resource intensity, I guess, of their life in terms of do they have do they have to uh do loads of washes you know how many washing machine runs do they have to do a week and that kind of thing or how many times do they go shopping for food or um different types of activities and then I get to talk to people a bit more about why they do things and that's how it came out all these kind of tinkerings that people do um in terms of um the strategies that they use to kind of adjust their kind of collective consumption with their individual consumption so um then so for example um using for, for example in that in that estate the heating system wasn't great so people would have sort of very hot water when they turned on the cold tap immediately in some parts of the state whereas they're in other parts of the state they couldn't um get hot water very quickly so they would use strategies to say cool down the hot water or use the first hot water as for washing up but they had all these strategies that then you can take stories of this into a community into the kind of um the process so we had narratives around what people had done strategies they'd used and then people start to see it's like oh it's not just me who turns mm -hmm. off the radiators it's not just me who tries to do this actually there's loads of people doing all these random tinkering bits um and then that becomes so even if they're not doing the same thing or they're not concerned about the same issues say you know they're concerned about water but not about electricity or you know these things they can start to see some commonalities um and then um yeah in terms of the other so then the other parts of the process we've been working with other people so um the designers in the first one in the um engineering comes home section we're called ii lab um, and they created this um it is actually i don't know whether i can get it i don't know whether we've got time to i can put it on screen yeah. um or maybe i can do the camellia one oops um let me just see sorry i'll just try and get it um Uh, but so then then we're working with kind of software designers and app developers who are creating, who are taking some back end technical. So um, in the first case, it was a kind of life cycle ass assessment. So we had some back end data around um, what what all the different technologies would do. Um, and in the Camellia project, we've got sort of hydrologists who are who are providing 
all the data on what happens when you put grass over concrete in terms of, you know, and then scaling that. And then we've got app developers creating very user friendly apps that people can just drag and drop. Let me see if I can get the, the Kipling one, um, because that's just a really simple. So this. Um, sorry. And then you might be able to see um, and what is really interesting and I think um, important for the project is the way that there, you know, there is a huge amount of technical expertise being used to understand to do all the evidence review and create the numbers that can be put into an app. But there is also a huge amount of respect for the lay, you know, for the residents understanding of what happens um, and for that shaping the kind of questions that we, the kind of data that you look for and how you display it um, and what the pertinent issues are. Um, so I just see if I can display my screen and then you can see the Kipling which is a very simple. Yeah, Charlotte, don't worry. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I get it going, I can. Already describing, uh, describing quite well, um, at least the role of these, um, um, let's say, easy interfaces um, that plays in kind of um, feeding into the, the qualitative and quantitative um, aspects of the research. Yeah, and we did so. That, so our group did use the output from our um, yeah. from what, one of our toolkits in their funding application. So my next step is to go and talk to the funders to say whether you know seeing a printout of of what they'd done with our toolkits, demonstrating yeah. that they thought about the water issues, did that have any material impact in the decision to fund them or not? And if it did, can we can we support them? Yeah. Um, happened am yeah. i sharing am yeah I sharing it's, screen? it's probably not the one that you um you wanted to share <laughs> just in another window <laughs> Don't worry, I I can't. just uh you can stop sharing your screen and then we just have Sorry. you can i, I don't know how to stop sharing question. my screen now <laughs> okay um yeah um i'd like to invite the audience um to ask questions um Oh, hi. OK, good. OK. Hi, Norma. Hi. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one relates to what you said at the very beginning uh, when you talked about Belgrade. And um, I wanted to ask you to expand a bit on the efficiency of system in socialism, um, which was obviously centralized and a much more comprehensive kind of um, uh, than, than what we have. Um, and um, at once it was very difficult for people to kind of fall through the system and um, drop off the grid. But also it generates a lot of waste because obviously you know, heating is, for example, the heating is still on even if you're not there, if there's nobody there. Um, and the second question relates to the current um, situation. Um, and I wanted to kind of ask you um, if you think, uh, does, does the current pandemic pose any kind of new challenges um, for the infrastructure? Uh, in terms of, for example, your uh, microphone is muted. Sorry, for example, so you said, does does the new um, does the lockdown create challenges? And I didn't hear in yeah, terms of what. For instance, yeah, uh, no, uh, there's new new kind of waste uh, because we all. Uh, everything is taken away, uh, we all kind of order everything, so there's a lot more packaging, but also plastic if you go anywhere in the par in parks. Um, there's lots of plastic gloves, uh, lots of um, disposable masks, and, and um, uh, obviously we've kind of experienced um, in cities um, acutely lack of um, open um, uh, green spaces for um, most of us who live in flats. Uh, so can it be used somehow to actually have more, um, uh, I guess, infrastructural approach <laughs> to, uh, 
towards building more green spaces in, in even uh, small kind of street, uh, uh, small smaller gardens or um, balconies. Um, yes, thank you um, for those questions. Yes, so firstly in Belgrade and in terms of efficiency, I think efficiency is a very funny term because it's a very sort of... Um, I sort of associate it with um, a particular form of practice that is around sort of individualizing risk. So I think, yes, there is a problem with massively wasteful systems, but um, when um, I don't see the issue with, so, so if you're trying to heat a whole building and you have two people who are away, it, like um, the heat will flow between the flats anyway. So even if you're out and yes, you shouldn't be heating that empty flat, but you will be heating it because they'll be surrounded by other flats that are being heated. So it will get heated. Um, but it's I think that the issue for me is um, the way people talk. It's, it's more about waste. I, for me, is the concern than efficiency. So when you see systems being retrofitted with metering technologies in the in with the argument that that is going to help efficiency because people will understand what they are consuming and therefore will have the agency to act over it and control it and they can turn off their heating and they can be responsible and not pay for it. But in fact, if the wastefulness is at the generating plant and through the, the pipes that go under the streets, then putting the responsibility on the end user or the consumer or giving them a sense that they have control when they don't have control, I think is a problem. So I completely agree that, that inefficient heating systems are no good for anyone. And I'm not sort of suggesting that that is a the socialism system was fantastic in creating this incredibly novel and brilliant system. I mean, it's a very standard way of heating a building and some countries do it very well and some systems produce very excellent central heating systems and district heating systems and some countries, particularly under-resourced ones, do a disastrous job of it and the UK is doing not very well at all in trying to roll out district heating and creating not very good systems that are not very efficient. Um, sorry, I don't know whether they're efficient or not. I haven't done enough research onto that, but I mean, there's a lot of debate and complaint from residents who find themselves on heating systems in this country that they would argue are not efficient so and, and I haven't seen the figures so I can't comment on that but um, yeah I completely take your point I just think what the interesting dynamic for me was this switch between um, was this argument that you can create a system you know it it is it is this sort of um, this tension between efficiency and wastefulness. There's a problem with wastefulness, and the question is whose responsibility is to fix that. And efficiency sort of suggests that there's this win-win situation in that the whole system is going to be made much better, and that the user will know what they're doing, and then the the end provider can have a better business and a more efficient business model. And it doesn't change the underlying reality, which is wastefulness, and we need to identify that. And um, yeah, and so. I think there's a very interesting thing to explore there. Um, yeah, people always, I think people always criticise me for suggesting that there was anything good about um, Belgrade's district heating system. But I'm just repeating what residents themselves said to me around what they found good about the systems and that it was reliably warm at certain times of the year. <laughs> Um, but in terms of the coronavirus and responding, yes, that's something that I've seen, um, the lockdown, that is something that I've seen in my own neighbourhood, is the re the re-exploration of, of different spaces. So people are using their front steps, they're turning, they're creating these kind of shared spaces or, or they're trying to find patches of green and, um, you know, people are growing stuff everywhere, um, sort of vegetables being grown in places that you hadn't even noticed before. Um, and so I think there is a real opportunity. I would hope there would be a real opportunity to start thinking um, start thinking about that and also about trying to support. So at the moment, there's also been this shift to kind of mutual aid and that, that community volunteer groups, unpaid groups are stepping in to deliver basic services in a context where it's not been possible any other way. And, um, and yet, how do you protect that? And how do you make sure that's not exploitative of the people who are doing it and that you protect the kind of the potential for radically changing the way that we consume things um, and the way that we provide resources locally, um, I think that's a really interesting and open question. And the thing about the waste, yeah, I don't know about the plastic waste. That's, um, I mean, I think that the thing is, is that we see, we see the, the rubbish in our parks because that rubbish would have been generated 
elsewhere and kept elsewhere. So I don't know whether it's just a chain, you know, whether the volume of rubbish has increased or whether it's just changed location or whether it's a small amount of volume of rubbish, but in a in the wrong place. Um, I think it's slightly also slightly different because now we have plastic gloves and yeah. You know, different, specific yeah. to the kind of and uh, much more takeaway cups because before, you know, because now all the cafes and restaurants, they're all takeaway only. Uh, oh, OK. And also there's a big issue with um, with the uh, provision of uh, public uh, lavatories um, uh, because that's, you know, another contradiction. You're allowed to spend uh, unlimited time outside in public spaces like parks and in, in fact it's good for you to go out but um, there, there's no provision uh, for for basic <laughs> yeah um, and, uh, so I've seen in some parks they started to, to insert public um, lavatories but obviously really? much more proper you know rain statement of, uh, you know so it's safe and clean rather than yeah yeah yes it's a yeah I mean it's a very interesting it's definitely um yeah it's just it's the, it's the it's that classic kind of infrastructure breakdown situation that suddenly people become aware of it because I mean you know we have sort of raw sewage rushing into the Thames every time there's a downpour almost um and you know these things get we need to be more aware of them definitely um but yeah, I don't have any answers, I'm afraid. But I definitely think it is a moment, an opportunity. I mean, it's definitely a moment that break, brings these questions and definitely, definitely highlights that kind of individual versus collective consumption and management. And how do we do that? What is my role in my community? And what, what does it mean if I'm just dropping my pair of gloves, you know, and then everyone does that? That's the kind of, that's the reality, I think. It's definitely those things and, and that people, but, but then there is also that reaction of people being, well, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm going to be the person out there with a litter picker picking it up because there's no, you know, the council can't do it. So I'm going to do it myself. And and that's it's a very interesting time to see, you know, the two sides of, of people's response to a breakdown in what they're expected to see. Um, and yeah, the issue of public toilets. I mean, yeah, I don't know what to say. Yeah. But thank you for the questions. Thank you. Um... Any further questions from uh, from the audience? I've I've just um, I'd like to actually ask a question going back to the um, the theme of retrofitting, um, which is actually uh, you know it's it's a big issue, it's a big challenge um, for the built environment um, industry, um, both from architecturally um, and also in terms of planning. And um, and do you? This is more a speculative question. Do you foresee that um, in terms of uh, being confronted what we call building stock uh, in uh, inner city and the uh, and the future of this building stock? And um, do you think this by tying in because retrofitting in in many respect more kind of uh, robust in terms of structure or offering different. Uh, uh, spatial arrangement flexibilities, you know, you can knock down walls and, and fit out uh, other thresholds um, or adding extension, etc, etc. But then actually to tie retrofitting more to the domain of infrastructure and it actually enables building stock to actually be tied into one another infrastructurally. Um, that actually is starting to be a new sense of a community because you can imagine, let's say, a group of buildings, uh, maybe the lights go out because of a power cut and there could be a switch somewhere where a neighboring building could actually uh, offer infrastructural support um, and um, in terms of uh, allowing it to function. And uh, do you think that would be a picture that uh, in terms of dealing with um, both the design of new buildings and then retrofitting of older building to have to start to have that relationship both structurally and infrastructurally? Yeah, I think so. Definitely that there has to be. Um, yeah. And that new buildings, I mean, you see it with hate networks that new developments are kind of the chance to get pipes in the ground that can then go off into old parts of the city. But um, I think just yeah, on a building by building basis, once a building can um, can start generating its own energy or perhaps recycling grey water or something and that then it is about okay well how do we best um, it's much easier 
as I was saying at the beginning around diversity of demand, it's much easier if, if you've got more sort of options, people connected, buildings connected for you to say, well, if, you know, our building can produce lots of renewable energy because we're in, we've got a certain aspect and, but we can't use it all because we're, well, I can't imagine the context in which a building wouldn't use electricity, but yes, there would be, um, I think that's definitely um, the way that things can happen technically. And then it's the question of how do you create the economic relationships that allow that to happen? So how do you start, yeah. you know, how do you start providing electricity to your neighbour? How do you start um, mm. letting them use your front garden to grow vegetables? You know, what, what are the kind of... Yeah. Um, what are the kind of relationships and governance structures and market structures that we need to develop? Um, yeah. And I am working, so I'm working, I've got a project with community energy groups who are precisely sort of in cities, community energy groups are looking for territories and areas that they can put assets on. So that could be a battery or that could be a solar PV array or it could be a some other form of, of um, asset and so they need to find and negotiate access to the space and then they need to find and negotiate access to the sort of consumers who can use that and generate value from it so I think these are going to be more and more um, issues that come up more and more and we're going to see I think particularly with estates sort of you know new builds and old builds have different opportunities so 60s estate has comparatively more space particularly the one I was just working in you know where you can have space to do stuff like put a collective battery that then could be used by the local grid but are they going to see the you know who gets the value from doing that I think are, are really big questions that are definitely being explored at the moment um yeah and then and the drive you know the imp the imperative for new builds to not consume anything only produce you know to be built in such a way that they don't need um yeah. old old school old fuel type situations um, yeah perhaps that is when uh, yeah you do put a, a clause uh, in terms of uh, what you should contribute in return for profit but profitability uh, yeah. and that could be something that at a policy level to in a way enforce um, and that new builds can do much more than just let's say be the best of energy performance themselves but then they actually should consider um, and contribute uh, towards the uh, neighboring um, older stocks um, and, and also the idea of retrofitting because a lot of um, let's say the estate uh, those that's fortunate enough not to be demolished uh, will be let's say uh, revamped by our private developers and then the deal is that yeah, they'll get planning so long as they uh, they still retain some of the uh, the older estates and then they can build new ones and so that's kind of tying the, the both agenda together of needing to retrofit with energy performance and then the new builds uh, being profitable but then yet needs to kind of tie the whole thing together um, and I think uh, you have provided I think uh, quite uh, many more layers of how that could be could be foreseeable <laughs> yeah no oh, yeah it's definitely I mean it's definitely the vision when you look at these opportunity development areas I think that's definitely the vision is that they do you know these are areas that are supposed to completely rework and try something new and then they're supposed the benefits are supposed to flow out from them in some uh not not terribly well described way um yeah hey can I ask a question sorry can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could uh, uh, identify or describe the key spaces, let's say, or the key design moves that you think are necessary uh, or that you have encountered in your in your studies that they have to be transformed in order to accommodate a new type of decentralized model. So, I mean, if you which are the key spaces, if you want, that they have to be converted, transformed, cancelled, rethought completely um, within existing, let's say, layouts or um, neighborhood plans, you know, maybe that maybe maybe there are different in different scales, of course, but I was wondering if you can point out to some, let's say, key spaces that you think um, they require our attention when we think about these new uh, models. Um. I guess uh, the key, I mean, the key spaces, I guess there's um, roofs um, are kind of key in trying to think um, of what should be um, 
yeah um how we I yeah I'm not sure I guess for me it's all it's always I'm always drawn to the kind of the communal areas and just thinking about these and and what um what possibility they have to to sort of generate value for the the individual households the kind of the, the neighborhood and then the, the broader systems the infrastructural systems that they're connected to and so I guess any any of those points the ways that that sort of corridors and, and basements and roofs and all these spaces that have um, less evident claims on them in terms of social value, they actually generate quite a lot of social value when you can start either greening them or putting renewable energy on them. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are sort of models out there. And I think one of the things that comes through co-design is the way that different community groups have different different priorities that are driving them so um i work with a group in um summerstown so that's between king's cross and um and euston around there and they're sort of a very polluted environment so then their understanding of their local area is all about where are the sources of pollution and what can they do how can they change the layout to 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 mitigate that um versus um you know that the estate i was talking about with the big concrete space so i think uh, because I only I really only work with community groups who are already in situ um, and that is the sort of challenge of retrofit I'm always directed to how they view their environment and I, I'm, um, I'm less involved with the kind of design stage but I guess um, when I find myself with opportunities I'm running a, um, a project in Brixton I'm not running it I'm, I'm working on a project in Brixton um, which is trialling peer-to-peer energy and there the fact that they've got a kind of area in a communal corridor somewhere that they can put a battery to be able to store some of their PV that becomes um, that becomes an opportunity for them um, and so I think yeah for me it's always the way these spaces kind of change and 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 to understand the implications because there, there always seems to be a kind of other effect down the line I yeah it's not a very good answer I guess I'm not very um I'm not so involved on the design stage I'm more involved in the kind of living stage once you've got once you've received the environment what can you do once you've got it um is more my kind of area Good. I don't know if that's a no, no thank you I mean it was more a question about you know even in the in the preliminary research that you know you have to do before designing which were the spaces that the urgency to redesign was more uh, declared if you want for me it's not that's what I meant you know not really you know, where, where where were the main problems you know or issues and I think you answer you know common okay. areas, yeah yeah and communal gardens and yeah, patches of land. Um, any questions? Other questions? Uh, uh, yes, I, I guess I would I would have a question. Um, hello, Charlotte, and thank you for your uh, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, I really enjoyed it a lot, and. Um, I mean, I couldn't agree more with the fact that uh, the more we associate materialities, institutions and technologies with this word of collectivity, um, the better we will probably use it. Because I don't know, as architects, I often have the feeling that we banalize collectivity um, in a dangerous matter where we only talk about like interest groups or social groups and dynamics that always conceive their identity through let's say, a visual matter of a space, of a certain ideology that they follow with the semiotics that go along with it. But most of the things that you were talking about are actually immaterial, or at least they are not visible in the daily matters. Uh, when you talk about an uh, energy storage system somewhere in a collective space, it's still something very, very abstract to take this as a, as a motive of collectivity, right? So um, I was wondering when you are starting to work with these, with these, with with these groups that are probably not experts in these infrastructural systems, how do you cause awareness for something that we cannot see? Um, how 
like do you have certain tools it kind of goes back i guess to doreen's questions do you have certain tools that allows them to kind of identify more with this hidden metrics that allows us to use the city as a service to a large extent yes yeah we do i mean so that's what that sort of comes under this this category of infrastructural literacy so literacy um okay. and so that was something that we sort of became more apparent in the engineering concept so in the first co-design sort of pilot that i that i worked on it was mm. precisely around this is yeah is that people are they have certain levels of of knowledge that they've gained through trying to achieve what they want to achieve through the systems that are in their home but definitely sort of thinking thinking more broadly um, and trying to um yeah and, and also overcoming some of the kind of ingrained understandings that may be not accurate in their own case um so people have often told me that they think electricity is cheaper in the evening i'm like well it's not why would it be are you is that what your tariff says is it cheaper mm -hmm. in the evening but they have this kind of sense because you know they may have one pint lived somewhere with a with a storage heater or something um so um so yeah we definitely have tools and the, and the tools that we use is is trying to um so in the first process, we, you know, people kind of were coming up with ideas and issues around kind of food waste or around kind of just dirty, you know, the rubbish flying around. And we were coming up with technical suggestions saying, OK, well, if that's the thing that's worrying you, perhaps we could look at this. But then if people didn't understand right. what does it mean, what does a wormery look like? How big is it? How smelly is it? Then we had to provide all that. And we kind of had. So this is why we have a sort of staged process where you kind of gauge levels of interest and then come back with kind of digested forms of, of expertise or technical designs or, or systems that might fit mm -hmm. given the context that they've described um, and yeah so that's where it's really a role of translating um, and yeah I'm sorry I couldn't show you the um, the apps that the teams had developed which are just really simple drag and drop you know if you put the flower bed here this means this for the water system if you put, okay. you know yeah. if you put a waste bin here this means this for carbon saved you know so right. they're, they're very simple kind of drag and drop tools that we talk through um what they mean in terms of and and then that's why we also then do these kind of safaris where you go out and you're like okay can you see that drain pipe does it have any connections into it that means you can't use that rainwater or that one doesn't so you can so there, there is definitely this process of kind of trying to trying to make tangible um and real and we do it by walk arounds and by mm -hmm. you know sort of apps and, and info information sheets um um yeah and we are because there are tools out there you know the the gla has a lot of kind of community-based green infrastructure tools um and so it is also just sort of pointing to those and and asking people Trying, trying to identify um, where there are those resources that, that, that try to make visible all these things that people do. But um, our latest project is with gardeners and they hadn't thought about the role that their gardens play in terms of managing flooding, you know, and, and so, you know, even though they're a fairly expert group in terms of growing and greening, then to understand, okay, what are the water impacts of my garden is really, so, you know, and that they're, they're, a, they're a very expert group, but we're still providing some level of, a different perspective and some level of technical information that they can really take and run with right. because they, they're you know they're they're a group that that is already kind of committed to working in this area um yeah and right. then i mean with the, with the electricity shifting is you know that was the classic economic incentive just texting someone saying try and win some money by doing this and then you could always make things visible by putting a price on it um right it's true. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> OK, thanks. OK, um, thank you, Charlotte, and thank you for um, the audience for your questions. And I think I will uh, I will draw the public uh, event to a thank close. You. I think it's uh, it's it's time. I think Charlotte do have to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. And um, um, thank you again. Yeah, it's just well, brings a lot of things that we've been uh, uh, interrogating um, in architecturally and also in a way um, via design research projects. Um, and you just bring a very different perspective. It's really, um, really, really productive. Thank you. Um, okay. okay. I just want to say a quick thank you to Doreen and to um, uh, Platon and to Hammond for organizing this series. It's been great to 
you know, take part and um, really enjoyed all of the uh, presentations. Um, and thank you, Charlotte, for thank you very your much. presentation too. Thank you, Nema. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah. <laughs>